you know, family trees, a great American, Vietnam veteran, you name it. Uh, former State Senator John DeCamp. And the story he's about to tell is documented. I suggest everyone get the Franklin cover up. Really understand the level of evil we're dealing with. Uh, and he's got a very, very uh, busy and successful law practice. We appreciate him taking time out to join us today. Uh, Mr. DeCamp, uh, good to hear from you today. Yes, sir. Uh, kind of a surprise visit here. You called to hear what first week and uh, one dad to talk to me, so I said, why not? Well, it's because Bohemian Grove is back in the news, headlines out in California. Was well, that right? Tell me more. Well, it's just, uh, well, you know, I got video out of there of, them, of somebody begging for their life and getting burned on a fire. I understand you have a video uh, that's been going out. I don't have a copy. I-, I need to get you a copy. You need to send me one. Yeah, I think last we had one about it eight months ago, and I said I would. I'm just so busy, just like you are. I know what you mean. But anyways, I'm getting attacked from the New York Times to you name it. They're saying, well, Jones says they're sacrificing people in there, and uh, all it shows is a mock human sacrifice. The paper even says that. Well, all I ever said is somebody begged for their life and they burn them. I was hiding in the woods 150 yards away, and they admit I went in and got the video. And But I never said they were sacrificing anybody. Um, and, you know, I, I know in, in one of your later editions of the book, uh, you actually have some uh, quotes in there didn't put in the first edition that, that you'd had back when you were investigating for the Senate uh, in there about, you know, the you know the owl and the grove and all this. But before we get into all that, uh, 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 Senator DeCamp, yes. go, you know, tell us about John DeCamp. Tell us how you got into this. You know, you didn't get into this to, you know, find all these hards. You were basically there to go disprove it for the Senate, right? I was, uh, I had just gotten out of the Senate a year or so before, and when this started breaking, let me let me give the story real quick. In North Omaha, Nebraska, there was a credit union, federal credit union, and it was run by a man named Larry King. Larry King, some of you may remember, and I'm sure you'll hear about him again. Not the Larry King on TV, but another one. He was officially listed in old New York Times, since you mentioned them, and a number of other state and national, mostly national publications. He was officially listed as the, quote, fastest rising black star in the Republican Party. Some of you who uh, may be listening may have attended the 1984 or 1988 Republican National Conventions, one in uh, Texas. I remember I was there, and I was there at the one in New Orleans then. Yeah, you're a Republican. Man. Let's you know, get that out there. Oh, yeah, I guess. Um, I'm the same way. Like, you know, I guess. These uh... days, you know, it's kind of like, but anyway. Uh, Larry opened both of those national conventions, as some of you may remember. In fact, when they refer back in old footage, they'll always show uh, the convention being open. Larry opened both of them by singing the national anthem. He's a great singer, a great uh, whatever you call it, baritone or alto or whatever those strange things are. Vocalist. Anyway. Huh? Vocalist. Oh, yeah, I knew it was one of those. Anyway, Larry uh, is the man that, that's singing there and opening the convention. And on Election Day 1988, when George Bush... Yeah, that would have been when George Bush was elected, November. Uh, the feds raided his little credit union there in North Omaha, was supposed to be serving the minority community, particularly the black community there. And they uh, they uh, shut her down and said there was a lot of missing money. And uh, stories started floating out as uh, always happens when some incident like that occurs. And some of the stories involved, well, there's missing money and it was used for this and that. But some of the stories were even strange. They were coming from kids all over, all over uh, young kids, you know, 16, 14, 13. Uh, kids telling about how they had been on Larry's private jet to this party or that party, or they had been at the Republican National Convention here, or they'd been at this political event in Washington. And the stories had to do with they were there and, and, and were used as drug couriers. You know, a 13, 14-year-old kid back then going to the airport could get through without anybody asking twice about anything. They'd pack them full of cocaine or whatever on little packs they'd carry on their body between their legs, et cetera, et cetera, young boys, young girls. And the kids also were telling these stranger tales uh, that seemed bizarre at the time, that they uh, had had uh, sex or were involved in sex with this or that famous politician or or businessman or whatever. And I was one of the first ones that stood up and said, you know, this has got to be the most hilarious, ridiculous stories I've ever heard. First of all, uh, you know, I, I knew Larry King. What the heck? I was head of banking at the time. He was he was uh, doing his banking stuff. Head of banking, uh, Senate banking committee and uh, uh, here in Nebraska. And uh, so I said, you know, this is just absurd. Well, the story started 
dropping more and more, and I said something else. And I said, look, if I believed even one of these crazy stories, I'd be the first one to stand up and demand that something be done. And I got a letter from a kid named Paul Benassi, who was in a jail in Omaha. And he said, look, if you'd come and talk to me, I could show you that these aren't just fake tales. Now, later you took his diary that went back like five years and had ink experts, forensic experts, look at it. He'd written all this stuff down. Yeah, that was the strange thing about this kid. I wish I had been able to do that throughout life. But anyway, apparently he was a little boy. He was about 18 at the time I met him in jail there, 17, 18. Uh, as a young kid, his uncle or grandfather or somebody had taught him religiously to keep a, a diary, you know, where you mark things down every day. Well, he did her, and he did her in detail. And so when, when I went and visited with him and he told me these strange tales, and then you had the head of psychiatry from one of the major medical institutions in the state, Creighton University, say, hey, this kid, uh, he ain't crazy. Uh, he's a multiple personality, and uh, he's probably telling the truth because multiples don't need a lie. They just switch personalities. Anyway, so to make a long, long, bizarre story short, uh, I found out that he was in jail because he had been one of those uh, intimately involved in all this, and he had to be shut up real quick. I'm making that as a conclusion. Now, at the time, I didn't realize that. but, but uh, And so they locked him up, charged him with, uh, touching another boy on the outside of his pants, a cousin or something, and blah, blah. Senator, talk right into your telephone for me. Please. Okay, anyway, so they they uh, they have him there, and I finally agreed I would represent him. And that led to a long, long tale that it got me deeply involved in researching, investigating the whole collapse of that credit union and the personalities involved. And ultimately, uh, on the advice of, of my best friend, closest friend, uh, godfather, whatever, eventually writing a, a, a book because he told me that what I should probably do to protect myself. And uh, that man was a man named Bill Colby. And about the time that uh, I started writing the next book, Bill, as you know, was head of the CIA and ended up floating dead uh, in a pond somewhere. But I won't get into that right now. But anyway, uh, so I wrote the book. And as I got at the very beginning of this story and working on it, one of the things that I did do was, uh, as I say, uh, as you say, obtained the diaries of this young boy to uh, to uh, see just what he did say, and then I had them check. And it wasn't just that. I mean, they grabbed the a bunch of experts, and the forensics were because somebody said, well, he could have made this all up later, you know. He could have made this up later. And, uh, and uh, so I wanted to make sure that wasn't done, and so we had forensics examined and said, well, this ink was done at a certain time. This could only been done, and on and on and on. Anyway, get to the heart of the discussion. Well, one just... more point, uh, uh, Senator oh, yeah. uh, John Camp, because, you know, I've actually seen the Discovery Channel documentary that never aired, and we actually played it here locally in Austin. Oh, uh, good. I was, I, was you know, I was sent a copy of it. Uh, they found hundreds of videotapes in King's office. The police saw it, freaked out, and hit it, have never released it. There were all these other children. People actually got convicted of this stuff. I want to oh, make yeah. people understand. This is what he said. This all happened, Yeah, this, this isn't a fantasy. I ended up winning a million dollars on behalf of, uh, against awful, awful, awful overwhelming odds, including the Omaha World Herald newspaper that, that attacked me so viciously because one of the key individuals that I got locked up in prison was their editor, one of their editors, uh, and another individual, but anyway. Well, let's, I mean, yeah, people are going to prison for this, and, and let's add another Larry caveat. King just got released from prison here about, what, eight, ten months ago. And, 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 well, hold on. And you were actually, you know, just out of the Senate, you were hired to go whitewash the operation. Because, you know, this is That's ridiculous. That's what I was hired for. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I, I did the opposite. Well, I call you an impeccable witness. Go ahead. Anyway, so, uh, yeah, I won the million dollar judgment in federal court finally. And it wasn't easy, and I, I want to talk about that a little because some of the stuff coming out about pedophilia in the church now or things written in my book way back then. Uh, but anyway, to get to the heart, of the heart of the matter that you called about, as I understand it, I took simply the diaries, Paul Bonatti, and I printed a good portion of them in my book. And one of them, one of the areas, described a trip in, I think it was 1984. I could even read part of it here. In, in fact in which he was taken to an area around Sacramento and then where they had the great big tall trees and then they went in where there's some owl, uh, big huge carved owl or something. And yeah, when we get back, I want you to read that. Okay. Well, please continue. Go ahead. All right, all right. Anyway, so uh, so there, there uh, was where he claims. And I wasn't there, so I don't know. In fact, closest 
as I've been to Bohemian Grove, he took me out and showed me where it was, and indeed there is a place there. And I didn't know there was a place called Bohemian Grove. I didn't write Bohemian Grove in the book because I didn't know what it was. I just took his diary. Anyway, and it clearly is where he was taken. And uh, he was taken out there for a ceremony in which, which they committed some pretty horrible things on another boy. They had three boys, and they filmed it, and I just took his words and the names he wrote there, and they're right in the book. And by the way, just, just to answer your next question, yes, I put names in the book, dates, and everything I could, just as they were. Why? Because I figured it blow it out all straight. And I said when, when a number of threatening calls came after the first edition came out, they said, well, this is the most libelous, slanderous thing we've ever heard. And I said, fine, I think I've done enough to prove it, and I'm satisfied if if somebody feels that way, if I said these, somebody said these things about me, I'd sue them for libel and slander. Here you are ten years later, and you're one in lawsuits. Well, there was one libel slander lawsuit as a result of the book. But that was one I filed against some group called Great Atlantic Telecast Company, some TV network on the East Coast, when they had uh, one of the characters of the book, who also happened to be running for president at the time, uh, go around saying, oh, don't believe this, don't believe this, this is a lie, and they supported him, and I said... So I sued him. Well, ended up they ended up paying me off and backing down and reaching a settlement. Stay right there, Senator. This is powerful info. It's all coming up. From his Central Texas Command Center, deep behind enemy lines, the information war continues. And now, back to Alex Jones on the GCN Radio Network. That's right. Right here in Austin, Texas, every month they're grabbing the equivalent of five first-grade classrooms with Child Protective Services. No rights, no nothing. Parents, it's just a total takeover. And the very people doing this here locally are involved in their own forms of wickedness, which is a whole other show. This stuff is prolific. It is, a, it is a cult of evil, and it's more widespread than you probably can imagine. Senator DeCamp, we were talking during the break, and uh, you made the point about how this is this, you know, this, this, this new world and laugh. What, what do you mean by this new world? Well, you just talked about some of it. You just talked about some of it about five, six years ago on behalf of a family here that was just totally destroyed by, quote, protective services. I filed a class action suit against the, the, the entire system, and finally, since I was financing it myself, I just couldn't keep it up, and they had unlimited lawyers on the other side. But I did bring out an awful, awful lot of things that uh, have sure proven up since then from the way they take kids, the way these your, your rights as a parent are pretty well destroyed. But I'm not going into that now. We can talk about that another day. Yeah, it's just such but, a horror. It's just a, a whole new world we live in from, I guess, uh, what I thought I grew up in here a long, long time ago, admittedly. And uh, I keep, I, I said to you, I said, well, it sure is a new new world order, I think, or something like that. And then I realized it was uh, using a worn-out phrase that I guess uh, some people are really trying to implement. But anyway. Uh, continuing, you actually have the passages in your book out of the diary. and then Well, I have, a, yeah, I have right here the diaries. You want me to read a little, okay? Now, understand that I didn't know that the thing was Bohemian Grove back then, nor did the kid when he was writing it. All he knew was he was taken to this place. Let me just read it. It'll take three minutes. Is that okay? Yeah, go ahead. I went in January. Now, this is Benassi, a kid named Paul Benassi writing this, and this is directly word for word from his, his uh, diary. I went in January of 84 on every trip. I was paid by men King knew for sex. In the summer of 84, sometime, I went to Dallas, Texas, and had sex with several men King knew in a hotel. I flew on YNR Airlines. By the way, that's a private airline or just private charter deal. And Cam Airlines, another private charter deal, normally for King. I never had much personally to do with King, only went where he told me to go. In or on July 26th, I went to Sacramento, California. King flew me out on a private plane from Epley Airfield in Omaha to Denver, where we picked up Nicholas, a boy who was about 12 or 13. Then we flew to Vegas to a desert strip and drove into Las Vegas into some ranch and got something. Then flew on to Sacramento. We were picked up by a white limo and taken to a hotel. I don't remember the name of it. We, meaning Nicholas and I, were driven to an area that had big, big trees. It took about an hour to get there. There was a cage with a boy in it who was not wearing anything. Nicholas and I were given these Tarzan things to put around us and, and stuff like that. They told me to, I won't use the word, uh, blank the boy and stuff. In other words, have sex with him. At first I said no, and they held a gun to my uh, 
uh, genitals, I'll use the word, and said, do it or else lose them or something like that. I began doing it to the boy and stuff. And Nicholas had anal sex and stuff with him. We were told to blank him and stuff and beat on him. I didn't try to hurt him. We were told to put our blanks in his mouth and stuff and sit on the boy's blank and stuff, and they filmed it. We did this stuff to the boy for about 30 minutes or an hour when a man came in and kicked us and stuff in the genitals uh, and picked us up and threw us. He grabbed the boy and started blanking him and stuff. The man was about... I'm not sure how to say The man was about so many inches long, and the boy screamed and stuff, and the man was forcing his blank into the boy all the way. The boy was bleeding from his uh, rectum, and the men tossed me and him and stuff and put the boy right next to me and grabbed the gun and blew the boy's head off. The boy's blood was all over me, and I started yelling and crying. The men grabbed Nicholas and I and forced us to lie down. They put the boy on top of Nicholas, who was crying, and they were putting Nicholas' hands on the boy's blank. They put the boy on top of me and did the same thing. They then forced me to blank the dead boy. It's pretty crude. They put a gun to our heads to make us do it. His blood was all over us. They made us kiss the boy's lips and do Anyway, do other things. Then they made me do something I don't even want to even write, so I won't. After that, the men grabbed Nicholas and drug him off, screaming they put me up against a tree and put a gun to my head but fired into the air. I heard another shot from somewhere. I then saw the man who killed the boy drag him like a toy. Everything, including when the men put the boy in a trunk, was filmed. The men took me with them, and we went up in a plane. I saw the bag the boy was in. We went over a very thick brush area with a clearing in it. Over the clearing, they dropped the boy. One said the men with the hoods would take care of the body for them. I didn't see Nicholas until that night at the hotel. He and I hugged and held each other for a long while. About two hours later, the men or Larry King came in and told us to go take a shower since we had only been hosed off at some guy's house. We took a shower together and then were told to put on the tires and things. After we were cleaned up and dressed in these things, we were told to put on short socks and a shirt and shoes and driven to a house where the men were at with some others. They had the film and they played it as the men watched. They passed Nicholas and I around as if we were toys and... Stay right there. This is the New World Order. What do they want to do to your... We're talking to former state senator John DeCamp. And then a year out of office, he was hired by the Senate to go whitewash uh, this big story to cover up the Republican Party. Of course, none of them really believed it. Who weren't involved. It was too ridiculous sounding. Too horrible. But you read the history books, elites have done this type of stuff throughout history. For some reason, uh, it's just they become completely controlled by Satan. Uh, bottom line, folks. And, uh, you know, I've read the book. I've seen the documents. I've seen the news articles. I've researched it all. It's true. Uh, people went to prison, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, John DeCamp, uh, I don't know if you want to read any more. And I know you're cutting out a lot of the names of some of these people and some of the well-known uh you know, movie producers and people that were there, and some of the other world leaders. Um, let's. I want to go back into the investigation. That's one of the clearest pieces of evidence. How they tried to stop it. One of the investigators was obviously killed. Uh, I think that's a good place to continue. Yeah, that's when I brought Colby in. Are, am I on now? Uh, yes, you are, sir. Okay. Speak up. Bill Colby was, as I say, a very close friend. When the head of the investigation, the one the Senate had hired to do the investigation. Uh, called from Chicago. He had gone there on a tip to pick up a bunch of material that would, uh, he thought, validate some things. And the... Uh, In fact, he called and said, I've got him, I've he, got him. He called from Chicago to the head of the Senate Investigating Committee, Senator Lauren Schmidt. He said, I've got him, we've got him by the blank blank. Anyway, uh, tomorrow, uh, set up a hearing. I'll be there to testify at 8 o'clock. And... Uh, he was in Chicago. He had his private plane there. He was a very, very careful, meticulous uh, pilot. And he had gone there ostensibly to take his son to the baseball game, which he did do. And then he picked up this material, and uh, he took off, and his uh, plane uh, came apart, spread over whatever just outside uh, Chicago. What's the name of that place? I can't even remember now. Just some town outside Chicago. The remarkable coincidental thing was one of the central central characters of the book, a man named uh, Robert Wadman, who had been the police chief of Omaha at the time of uh, these events that, that are written about in the book, had become the new police, of, police chief in this other town. Not suggesting anything, just saying it's 
some of the most remarkable coincidences in the world. And since that time, I've learned from the sheriff's office, who was first on the scene, it took them years to come forward, how they uh, had the FBI swoop in, or federal officials, they claimed, and uh, took all the stuff and told uh, that he had seized, you know, pictures and stuff that they found laying around it, and uh, told the uh, sheriff's deputy who was there, you've not been here, you've not seen anything, if you talked, you're in trouble, blah, blah, compromising federal investigations, this and that. Anyway, Gary Caradori and his son were both killed in that accident, and of course he didn't testify. And it was only years later when I was still trying to pursue it in the federal court on a trial to prove some things, that I learned through a pure fluke of fate again, and it's been that way all along. Some little strange thing happens that, that keeps proving once again when they want to say this didn't happen or this couldn't have happened or whatever, some new little thing comes forward that proves it. And in this case, it was a call from a police, uh, the detective who was head of the patrol, the detective who was head of the state patrol in Oregon, and he told me that... Uh, they had just arrested the person and seized uh, a bunch of material in there, found a copy of this book, The Franklin Cover-Up, which we're talking about right now. And and this person had this in his possession, and they saw certain pages underlined. And, uh, and they said, I said, what's the person's name? They said, well, his name is Russell Nelson. And uh, eventually, to make a long, long story short, uh, I got him out of prison, got him up here to testify and bring pictures and tried to seize other pictures that, eventually got destroyed accidentally always by the courts. And uh, he was a key witness and ended up in the million-dollar judgment. He was Larry King's private photographer who had been, been going to these various things and, and taking pictures that would compromise politician A or whatever with a kid or with this or that. Yeah, the report uh, produced by the BBC people that was going to air on Discovery actually shows the police admitting all this. I mean, they grab all these videos, and photos. It's just like the finders in D.C. to see, you know, that outfit with all the kids. I know it extremely well. I was the first one they called when that broke, and I went there. Yeah, and you know, that's another story. We can't even mention what was in that warehouse, but it's it's all too profane. But I mean, this is just like stuff out of the pit of hell. Well, see, I, I know people listening right now will think, you know, this is la la land. This is make believe. These are fruit cakes. Talking about this, this couldn't happen, particularly with prominent people. Uh, they wouldn't be diddling little kids and, and wouldn't be, uh, well, unfortunately, I also believe that. I guess I still want to believe that, but I'll guarantee you some bad things have happened out there. They do happen. One of the coincidences that I think is going to rock some people here very shortly is one of the centerpieces of this uh, thing was using a lot of kids out of a place called Boys Town. Boys Town, of course, is one of the most respected institutions in this country, as it should be. It's done more for young uh, boys throughout the last, what, 75 or 100 years probably than just about any other institution you want to mention. At the same time, corruption can occur. Uh, even the best apples can get a rotten spot. And in this case, as I identified very clearly in the book, uh, Larry King was operating and getting kids out of there and using them. Well, of course, uh, the Discovery Channel that, sent the team in from Britain, spent about a half a million dollars doing things, and I think that was one of the centerpieces of their... You, you've seen that one, right? It was the air. Oh, yeah, we accidentally played it on TV. Okay, anyway, uh, they pretty well established that. But anyway, the head of Boys Town, the head of Boys Town is now an 87-year-old man, a Monsignor, and uh, guess who his newest attorney is that he's hired because he's getting old and is worried about wanting to get some things told and get some truth out which might happen about next week. His newest attorney is a young man. Well, he's not young anymore, is he? A uh, man named John DeCamp who wrote a book called The Franklin Cover-Up. And if anybody would have reason to want to attack me, it was him. Instead, he's doing the opposite. Now, right. repeat that again. Uh, uh, he hired me within the last week or ten days as his private attorney because, because of uh, some of these things you've been reading about in the national press, uh, the pedophilia of the priests and so on. He's an old man now, and uh, he's 87 or 88. And, and who was, is he again? He was the head of Boys Town. Oh, okay. On Senior Hup. He also was the only Catholic priest ever appointed as a delegate to the United Nations. He was a special delegate appointed by, I think, two different presidents as a representative to the United Nations on behalf of children. And he's going to blow the whistle. He's going to provide some information that I think will rock some people and... 
Of course, they'll immediately denounce him and shut him up, I suspect. But just to alert you, you might read something. Well, I hope he's got bodyguards around him right now. No, he's an old man that uh, probably will be an outcast once he does this. So I've said too much on that already, probably. Well, that's he incredible. That. I tell you, you're all over the place, too. Uh, with the, uh, I remember the case, you trying to expose Child Protective Services, and then, of course, you're going after the whole Columbine deal. Well, you're... I was hired by... Some of the, the teacher's family, you know, the one teacher that was killed, who represent a group of people, and we have filed a lawsuit because these kids, Harris and Klebold, out there that killed all these people, uh, they were absolute unlimited addicts of a couple of video games that are just trained kids to be... Well, Doom was killers. produced Doom. by... Doom. Doom is a military game, they admit. That's correct. That's correct. Because they found that soldiers, and in Vietnam especially... Most people will not fire up close on somebody, and and through the video games, it trains them to disconnect and do it. And this is what our, these will be our SWAT team commanders for the future. Now they found out a bunch of the SWAT teams are actually shooting the kids too, so it's incredible. Getting back into the Franklin cover-up, it's such a huge story. There's so much evidence of it, and a lot of these people actually got convicted. Some of the low-level minions. That's about right. Uh, some of the low-level minions, but. Uh, I mean, after writing the book and being out there for you know many, many years now, what has the effect been? Have they just moved the operation out of Omaha, Nebraska? I would not say that, that is completely correct. I believe the operations that they were doing still occur, still are occurring. Where all they emanate out of, I don't know. And I have been very, very reluctant to say anything at all that I didn't absolutely have a smoking gun and able to prove. Why? Because, believe me, when you start tampering with some of the people that, that we tampered with in this thing, uh, you learn real quick that they have the power to do a lot of hurt and damage and threats and things like that. So I've been super cautious. But if you ask me, is it stopped now, my answer would be no. Now, when you talk to the former CIA director and he said, write this book for your safety, that's what I've always told the listeners. It's like Jennifer Flowers on Hardball saying, Bill Clinton's killing people. And he says, well, why are you saying that then? She goes, well, this is my protection. Okay, I'll tell you the exact story and the reason I even wrote the book. I was with Bill in Washington, D.C., where I used to stay at his house on occasion. And uh, he had been hired, he had been hired by the Senate to actually look into the death of Gary Caridori. And after he did some investigation, whatever, he basically told him, you're never going to know the answer. Anyway, so I was sitting with him, and I, I was talking to he and his wife in, in his uh, place one night there. And I was saying, well, I don't know what to do next. I said, uh, <laughs> I, I see prosecutors who are afraid to prosecute. I see I see politicians who, 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 who uh, shouldn't be there. I see institutions of government who which are rendered ineffective because they've been compromised or corrupted or threatened or whatever. I said, oh, I, I don't know what to do. He said, I'm going to tell you what to do. I said, oh, thank goodness. And he says, get as far away from this thing as you can. Forget you ever saw it, know about it, heard it or anything else. And I said, wait a minute. You're telling me, uh, you know, the, the former head of the CIA, particularly uh, during the Vietnam thing and all that nonsense, I said, you're telling me that I should just walk away and pretend it didn't happen. He says, John, I love you. I love your kids. love your family. And he says, this is just a little more serious than you think. And, and he says, let me tell you a story. So then he starts, and he says, last night I returned from Moscow. I said, what the blaze is this? The head of the C, former head of the CIA doing in Moscow? He says, well, believe it or not, we were there to, uh, along with some others whose names you'd recognize, trying to make sure nobody pushes a button and does the wrong thing because things are unstable. Now, this occurred exactly, this conversation, exactly three weeks before the famous Gorbachev, uh, whatever, the revolution, and then the fall of uh, the Soviet Union, you know what I'm talking about, where they held held uh, Gorbachev hostage for a while, remember? Yeah, and, and Bill. What's his name? Well, Bridge never then or whatever comes and takes over. And, I don't know. Anyway. Yeltsin. Exactly. Yeltsin, that was it. Uh, they, uh, exactly, three weeks before that. He says things are unstable. Anyway, then he says, uh, you know, it was the uh, night before I was to leave. I couldn't sleep. I was thinking, he says, about the momentous event I was participating in. He says, so I decided I'd uh, 
middle of the night, I couldn't sleep, and said, I'd just go for a walk. Of course, I knew that was forbidden, you know, for everybody knew who I was, and guards wouldn't let me out. He says, but they just ignored me. I walked down this hall of the hotel, the most prestigious hotel right there on Red Square where we were staying. Uh, he said, I walked up to the door of the Kremlin at 2 o'clock in the morning. Guards watching me. Nobody paid attention. Nobody cared. He said, walked up right to the statue of Lenin there, you know. Nobody cared. He said, 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. He said, and then it struck me. He said, well, what struck you, Bill? He said, that it's dead. They were dead. That it's over. The Cold War is over. We've won. Now, remember, I say this is three weeks before all this broke loose and the whole thing collapsed. And I says, "Uh uh-huh. And he said, and then something else struck. I said, well, gosh, what was that? He says, that this, 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 Walk in the middle of the night in absolute silence with nobody caring in the middle of Red Square by the former head of the CIA who had fought these blank people for 40 years that this was going to be the only victory parade I and all the Cold War warriors would ever have. We wouldn't have a march down Madison Avenue like the soldiers in World War II or whatever. He said there wouldn't be any victory parades and ticker tapes. Just this march... I said, well, Bill, that's a real interesting story, but for gosh sake, what's my great lesson I'm learning? He says, what I guess I'm trying to tell you, John, is sometimes there are forces too big and too evil, even though we know they're there and we know it absolutely, for us to deal with in the way we would want or should or could, and therefore you have to turn and walk away if you want to live to fight another day. It doesn't make sense to me, but uh, anyway. And he says, these forces are too big and too evil and too powerful, and you're just going to get killed if you keep playing around. And he said, I don't want that. I said, well, you mean there's nothing I can do? He said, well, you have to do something. The safest thing, best thing you can do for your own safety is write your story. Tell it all is. It may be ridiculed. may not be believed. But at least if you tell it, there's no reason then to do you in. We'll just try to ridicule you. Yeah, because then that'll make exactly the book what even more powerful. They don't want to make the book a martyr. Uh, I mean, there's so many facets to this. How many children were you able to confirm were involved in this? And you know, I didn't uh, confirm a total number. I dealt with, I think, probably 25 or 30 that were really intimately involved. And a lot of these were children, according to the book, the news articles, the press, were children that didn't even know each other, cross-referencing in the, in the same thing. Oh, yes, so, absolutely. In other words, it wasn't because one kid said this. And, and, and the, the story of, uh, of, of the good guys in this is that, well, these kids just got together and made up this terrible hoax. It's all a hoax perpetrated by these absolutely penniless poverty children who all got together somehow and told this tale. Get real. Anyway. But there were convictions, and uh, you wrote the book, and nobody sued you because, I mean, these children didn't, you know, know. You know, they're getting flown to Sacramento and then driving for an hour. That's how long it takes to get to the Grove, and then they describe it, and... Uh, in great detail, and the and the stuff that had come out earlier, and, and then I've been there for their big, you know, to do when it's not a small crowd, when it's a big crowd, and it's done with all this regalia, bring a bound body in, it begs for its life, they burn it, it screams in pain, and that's just the stylized stuff they do there. And Skull and Bones came out on Fox News last year, splitting a woman's throat, the blood squirts. Why was there a police investigation? My neighbors saw me splitting women's throats and worshiping Satan, which they were doing, by the way, on the tape. In my backyard, wouldn't they call the cops on me? Wouldn't the cops have probable cause, John, uh, for a search of my house? I mean, I sure think so, but then once again, everything sounds so unbelievable or something. I mean, I would expect to see the police ripping out my walls, you know. I mean, if I saw my neighbor doing this and I reported, I would expect a warrant and, a, and a, you know, a five-day search. Yeah, I know. Uh, as I say, uh, the problem is that gap between something outrageous and... Uh, what the average human being is capable of believing based on their own human experiences. And as I is say, that the New World Order's trick, is that they do everything in plain sight so overtly, it's just so arrogant, so insane that the average person just can't even even process it mentally? Well, I'm not sure what the plan is or isn't. I guess I admit I'm not smart enough to know. I do know that what I wrote about and, and what occurred here, I absolutely know and believe occurred, and it's pretty horrible. And uh, if that's part of some larger program or plot, then I'm really worried. So some Here's of these, for us all, so to speak. So yeah, that's what they think of us. So some of these people are now getting out of prison. Some of the low-level minions. Larry got out. 
the editor got out. Uh, a couple of the others uh, got charged and paid a fine and didn't go and got felonies dropped to them, misdemeanors. But for all practical purposes, uh, anybody who uh, was in prison has been redeemed as somehow holy now. Ah, Chris. Folks, if you want to load the phones up, we'll let you talk to John DeCamp. We'll also tell you how to get his powerful book. It's thick. It's, it's, it's captivating. It's painful to read, but you need to get it. 1-800-259-9231. We'll be right back. All right. Phones are loaded up here, and I think uh, the Senator will finally stay with us for another 20 minutes or so. So we'll start trying to go straight to him. We've got another guest coming up on the Second Amendment a little bit later. And I'll be back tonight live from 9 to midnight. Before we tell you how to get the book, which he's come on several times before and doesn't even really plug it, but I think everybody should get it. It's excellent. Uh, give it out to everybody. Donate it to your library. People need to know what's happening. It's flawlessly documented. Stood up for, what, over eight years now. You know, none of these creatures sue him because they can't. <sighs> the facts are the facts. Before we do that, though, if you want to see Dark Secrets inside Bohemian Grove, I snuck into this labyrinth two years ago, and it made international headlines, and I'm still getting attacked for it today. Find out what all the hubbub is about. It's 2595, two hours and four minutes long. Dark secrets inside Bohemian Grove. Here's the toll-free number to order. Operators are standing by. 1-888-253-3139. That's 1-888-253-3139. Or go to Infowars.com or net. That's Infowars.com or net. Order the films online or to get the mailing address or phone number if you missed it. And again, that toll-free number one more time is one 888 Two five three three one three nine. Before we go to all these calls, uh, Senator Camp, how do folks get the Franklin cover-up? Oh yeah. Uh, if anybody wants it, and by the way, just so you know, I've never spent one penny trying to advertise or anything. The book I wrote it, as I say, for my own reasons. Uh, it's got over eighty-five thousand copies now sold. But anyway, A W T Inc. A W T Inc. Box Post Office Box Eight. Five four six one Lincoln L I N C O L N Nebraska N E B R A S K A six eight five zero one. It's uh, uh make it just twelve bucks shipping and handling. It's actually a little more than that, but if just mention Alex Jones and it's twelve bucks shipping handling and everything. It's only twelve dollars for a four hundred page book? Yeah. What the heck? Give that address out slowly. A W T E. Or if you just write cover up, it'll do anything. They know that here. Box eight five four six one, Lincoln, Nebraska six eight five zero one. Check. Money orders, cash, ruples. No. <laughs> anyway, just making an even twelve bucks, and I'll instruct them that that I said that on this program, so that that's what it costs for shipping, handling the book, everything. And if you want more than one book, well, I've seen it in uh, books. Yeah, go ahead. I've seen it in some of the bookstores for like $25. Yeah, I know. They're getting rich, not me. <laughs> All right, we'll give it out again before you leave. I don't want everybody to get it. Rose in South Carolina, thanks for holding her on the air with a Senator DeCamp and the Franklin cover-up. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. DeCamp, I've got a little story to tell you about your, this gentleman here in our state. Uh, it made national news but while the national election was going on last year, and he carried barbecue sauce, but he also had a table full of paraphernalia down there of the Confederate different stuff. But among all that was your book. Oh, yeah, the guy they went after and said he couldn't... Um... Yes, and I think maybe... Now, no one admitted this. Yeah, well, we... hold on. I mean, for those that don't know, uh, uh, Rose, and I'll hold you over if we, if we need to, uh, a gentleman... Uh, up there in the Carolinas uh, was... Maurice Bessinger. Yeah, was uh, flying the Confederate flag out front of his barbecue sauce company, and it was on all the stores, one of the most popular brands. They need to get him on. And so they demonized him. He's a patriot. There's nothing wrong with the Confederate flag, folks. And uh, and, and they attacked him in the interna international media. You're saying you were there and saw him. He was promoting the Franklin cover-up. Go ahead. He went down there one time and uh, and ate some barbecue sauce, and there on that table laid the Franklin cover-up. So we bought it, and I was wondering in the back of my mind if that was not part of the problem he was having because the elections were going on. 
I do not know. This is the first I knew about this. Is that it, Rose? All right. Thanks for the call. We'll be back with our guests and other calls. Stay with me. From his Central Texas Command Center, deep behind enemy lines, the information war continues. It's Alex Jones and the GCN Radio Network. All right, folks, we've got uh, Senator John DeCamp. In a couple more segments, we're going to go to Charles, Chris, Roger, Larry, and uh, that'll probably be yet. We may have time for a couple other calls, but since a lot of stations just tuned in and a lot of new people are tuning in every millisecond, Senator DeCamp is in about two minutes in a nutshell. Uh, again, tell folks about the Franklin cover up, what you discovered, what happened, uh, and this is on the record. It's been proven, folks. Uh, just, just, just for a, uh, just a recap of what's going on here. Wow, two minutes. Well, about 10, 12 years ago, whatever it was. Uh, they seized a federal credit union in Omaha, Nebraska, run by a man named Larry King. Larry King was a black man, officially identified as the fastest rising black star in the Republican Party. And they found multi, multi millions missing, and then stories came out about how Larry and some of his top political cronies were using children as drug couriers to deliver drugs across the country and to compromise politicians and businessmen and be uh, sex slaves and this kind of nonsense. Uh, horrible as it sounds and unbelievable as it sounds. Anyway, uh, I, <laughs> at the time, uh, was one of those who poo-pooed it more than anybody and said this has to be absolutely impossible. And then one thing led to another, and I ended up representing some of these children, particularly one where I uh, ended up winning a million-dollar judgment on his behalf, by the way, against in federal court after fairly, what, five, six, seven years it took. And... Uh, it's uh, more than a little interesting because I think it's proved to be very true and that, uh, unfortunately, there's some bad things uh, going on sometimes behind the scenes. And then it led into uh, a wooded area with big redwoods and owl snuff well, films. Was certainly one of the events that, that uh, sacrificed the children was involved in, a place in California that I only learned in the last few years is called Bohemian Grove. All I knew it was from the kids' diaries, a place with big trees where the big owl looking at them where they had... And the Senate investigated the uh, Senate did investigations. Uh, people mysteriously died who were involved. Well, in it. almost anybody who was anybody involved in the investigation either ended up dying or uh, discovering they wanted to commit suicide or things or another. There were, I think, I listed 22 something like that deaths in the book of uh, key individuals involved. Mm, sounds like Enron. I'm just glad I didn't list mine. You know where Enron started, don't you? No, where? Omaha, Nebraska. That was our biggest company until it moved to Houston, Texas, 15 years ago. Ken Lay made a promise he would never leave Omaha. 30 days later, they announced the move to uh, Houston. Didn't know that, did you? See? Hello. Do they tie into it? Read the book. <laughs> yeah, I've read the book. I just assume any... Uh, I, I don't specifically have any knowledge of Enron other than that they came from Omaha, Nebraska. It's incredible, ladies and gentlemen. Let's cram a call in here. Charles in Florida, you're on the air. Go ahead. Yeah, Alex? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, I remember reading about Bohemian Groves and the Intellectual Digest back in the 70s, about 25 years ago. The first time I read about it, and I, uh, this was an article in a liberal, a short-lived liberal paper called Intellectual Digest. It doesn't exist anymore, but uh, they were talking about the uh, author I, who I corresponded with was Later, uh, uh, was talking about even uh, David Rockefeller and uh, uh, William Buckley were involved in setting up stage scenery at Bohemian Groves, according to the magazine article I had. And it's interesting to me, you know, Kissinger goes there. I've been reading over the years about Bohemian Groves and uh, and their antics. Uh, uh, I wonder if your uh, guest would comment about what Ted Gunderson has has said on, on different times. I, I heard him one time years ago on WWCR talking about this, this same group. I think the, the group he, he he uncovered in Los Angeles with the McMartin. Hello? Yes. Uh, I guess you're going to have station. Uh, okay, we'll McMartin put your hold on. We'll let, hold on. we got a break. We'll let the camp comment on that when we get back. And then, uh, then we'll talk to uh, Chris and uh, Roger and Larry and others. Oh, it's incredible. Yeah, Ted Gunnerson, former head of the FBI in Southern California. 
and he's exposed a lot of that as well. We're getting him back on the show as well. All right, it's all coming up right here. Infowars.com is the website. Check it out. Big Brother. Mainstream media. Government cover-ups. You want answers? Well, so does he. He's Alex Jones on the GCN Radio Network. And now, live from Austin, Texas, Alex Jones. Defending liberty, resisting tyranny to the hilt, ladies and gentlemen. I'm your host, Alex Jones. Live, six hours a day, Monday through Friday, from 11 a.m. until 2 p.m. All time Central Standard, returning live from 9 to midnight. And again, the websites are InfoWars.com and InfoWars.net. And definitely check out our Bohemian Grove section as it has been radically expanded and improved. But even more video clips there for you. Of the sickening activities going on, we're talking to former State Senator John DeCamp, Vietnam veteran, uh, state investigator, hired to go basically whitewash this, found out it was all true. People went to prison, exposed it. Uh, child sex slaves, drug couriers, an absolute nightmare, and how it ties into the global elite, some of the biggest names you can imagine. Uh, Mr. DeCamp, Charles was, was, uh, was, was, was raising some questions about Ted Gunderson and the other Charles info. Charles raised an interesting question, and I'll try to answer it. Because Mr. Ted Gunderson, the former head of the FBI in Los Angeles, uh, former head in, as he jokingly says, he was in, uh, let's see, the three major cities where everybody was assassinated what was, uh, you know, King and then uh, Kennedy and then the other Kennedy. Anyway, he was head of the FBI in each of those just, I think, before they occurred or after. But anyway, Ted Gunderson was hired by a group of very prominent businessmen to come to Nebraska and investigate this thing and come up with a report to prove that I was full of beans and crazy and so on and so forth. I don't know if you know that. If you talk to Ted Gunderson, you'll find that out. He was hired for that purpose. He came to Nebraska. He was extremely aggressive. And, as fate would have it, he concluded rather quickly that I was the one telling the truth, and he was hired to uh, uh, use... No, I know that. He's been on the show, and he recommends your book. He he was hired to uh, make me look bad. In fact, he's since then become probably my closest friend in the world. Well, yeah, that was the whole start of him turning into an evil right winger, too. Yeah, anyway, and uh, going that around. Was, exp- that was his beginning. So anyway, he was the one then that uh, got denounced by a lot of people because he had graduated from the most sacred institution in Nebraska and had been a member of the absolutely most sacred thing we have in this state, which is the Nebraska football team, a big red. <laughs> He had actually been on the Big Red football team once upon a time, believe it or not. A corn husker, huh? A corn chucker, yeah. So anyway, these businessmen who had risen to prominence here and across the country hired Ted to come in and uh, prove that these terrible things I was saying and issues I was raising and lawsuits I was filing were all bogus. And he ended up staying here, I don't know how long, a year and a half. Or no, so. no, Ted's told that story. That was his whole beginning, finding out about the New World Order. He just gotten out of the FBI. He had this... Big security investigation cabinet. They, they hire him, have a bunch of money to go up there, disprove it, just like the Senate hired you to disprove it. And <laughs> he, started, he started investigating. Wow, it's true. Uh, so anyway, we became close friends. He uh, is a center, central character in, 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 in my book, one of the key, key individuals. And uh, we're still working on things. He, uh, he was back here working on some other things, the ones I was just talking to you at the very beginning of the program involving the good Monsignor, former head of Boys Town, who's about 87 years old and probably going to rock a few people here sometime soon. Mm-hmm. And, well, the uh, whistle. Well, let's, let's jump into those calls. Charles, real quick, finish up because i got a bunch of calls here. Charles in Florida, does that answer your question? Yeah, I wanted to say uh, Ted Gunderson one time years ago on, uh, on WWCR said that the, the group that he had uncovered in uh, Franklin, or with you in the Franklin cover-up in the McMartin Day School in Los Angeles had branches in practically every country of the world, including North Korea and China. Would well, that's like why when they asked me a question earlier, and I don't know if you were listening, when they asked me a question earlier about whether, quote, this still exists in, quote, Nebraska, my answer, I think, was pretty much, uh, 
I don't have an answer. Well, look, we know snuff films are on in the hotels in many areas of Asia. This is a big business. Grabbing your kid off the front lawn, torturing the daylights out of them. They're looking, they're after your kids right now. A lot of the ones they grabbed with child protective services ended up getting eaten by Rottweilers, raped, sold into prostitution. This has all been in the mainstream news in Massachusetts. Defend your family, folks. Don't let them take your kids. Don't let them rape and kill them. Let's go ahead. I'm not playing around here. Thanks, Charles. Uh, let's talk to Chris in Kentucky. Real quick, Chris, go ahead. You're on the air. All right, thanks, Alex. I am just outraged that this went on and the public is not knowing about this. John DeCamp, thank you for coming out and the FBI agent out in California and him too, because we need more leaders like this to get this out to the people. The wickedness of this, this George W. Bush who went to the Bohemian Grove, I just, I've lost respect for this leadership. Did we get somebody who is a statesman representing the people in this country? I, I'm just real angry hearing about this because... Well, by the way, I got the San Francisco Chronicle, New York Times, all of it admitting uh, the president, his father, and all of them know that I got pictures of them under the owl from their own publication. Amazing. And that's why, you know, I've people, new listeners out there, if you are not knowing what the Bohemian Grove is, Dark Secrets of the Bohemian Grove, go to the website, Infowars.com, order it, take it to your church, take it to your pastors, because the problems of some churches I went to, how great Christian George Bush is, it's... Get real, folks. It's not what it is. You get it off your truck. Well, George Bush just likes the food at Bohemian Grove. He's not involved in any of this. Yeah. Okay, let, let, let me say something here. It's kind of important. Go I ahead. don't know what George uh, does or doesn't do or his children or whatever. I guess I know him. But anyway, uh, I, John DeCamp, who wrote this book, was the number one vote-getting delegate pledged to George Bush when he was president at the... Republican National Convention, I was the number one vote-getter from Nebraska attending the Republican National Convention in uh, New Orleans and Texas and so on and so forth. And I guarantee you, I had no idea uh, any of this was going on at the time. At the same time, uh, I also attended the single biggest party ever put on at any, I think at any uh, uh, national convention. That was put on by Larry King at the... Valley Valley Ranch. Ranch. South Fork Ranch in Dallas at the Republican Convention there in, I think, 84. I attended it. It was only later one of the things I was able to absolutely know when I went to interview this kid, Paul Benassi, in prison I told you about, knew absolutely he was telling the truth when he starts describing that party and that convention as well or better than I could, and you would have had to have physically been there, which he was, to know some of these things and see and, and identify some of these things. So... Just because you were at a party, and Larry King, by the way, rented a mansion on Embassy Row in Washington, D.C. that cost about $5,000 a month during all this time, even though Larry King officially was earning $16,000 a year during this time. He rented well, a mansion. Well, let's go further. I mean, he, he had this mansion. They used the Bohemian Grove to compromise. Party. They used it to compromise people. Uh, uh, Dick Nixon, Richard Nixon said, quote, and this is on the record, I have a news article, it's the most faggy place he'd ever seen. He hated to go there, but he went there for power. He went there, you know, to smooze. And, you know, so got to make all that clear. Exactly. And we're not even saying that, that, that even though this is what the evidence shows, that this is going on at the, at the Grove and these witnesses, uh, it, it, a lot of people just cannot bring themselves to admit this is, uh, you know, the full magnitude. Uh, Chris, thanks, thanks for the points. Uh, let's talk to Roger in Pennsylvania. Roger, you're on the air. Welcome. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks. And just the uh, perfect segue into the, to my question. Can you think of any possible alternate explanation for uh, uh, you know, we have very few people in the high ranks of the muckety muck? Uh, I mean, the, the, thir- the secrecy is just so thorough that not even 10 or 20 years later does anybody come out, uh, whether through conscience or getting religion, uh, saying what what is said, whether it's just on plain matters of policy or or politics, at, uh, like the Bilderberg meetings, etc. We had uh, the only one I can think of that ever came out was Chester Ward when he wrote the book of Phyllis Schlafly. But you have you have hundreds of lower level muckety mucks that are just being groomed for power and uh, haven't necessarily compromised themselves. And you may recall when John McCain uh, was fairly threatening to uh, topple the uh, Bush dynasty. Uh, the, even before that, the rumors were coming about about the Vietnamese having some 20 reels of video with him in sex. Uh, yeah, it's all about compromise. What's the question? So, well, I'm, I'm almost getting there. Another 30 seconds. Uh, so we had, uh, and then you recall then that Rush Limbaugh just barely hinted about it on his show, and 
And it's like John McCain just went silent after that. Okay. And, and so, my, so you're my, talking about compromise. Uh, yeah, my, my, my point, if you allow a few more seconds. Well, no, we don't have time. Well, uh, I, here's what I'm thinking. Is there any other possible alternative to that, whether one is in pedophilia or some other occultism, uh, that they get compromised on these tapes, and that is the condition of their being inducted into uh can you think of any? Yeah, that's how you join the club. That's how the mafia does it. Even low-level gangs, you got to kill somebody before you're a made man, uh, John. Yep, you just said it all. In other words, you take an individual and you force them to do some abnormal, unnatural act, particularly at a young age. And some of these horrible, uh, I hate to say it, fraternities that are bones. one. That was one thing Colby kept warning me and warning me about. The, 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 the way the country had created so many systems where secrecy is the key. You remember why he was fired, why Bill Colby was fired from the CIA, and he was replaced by a man named George Bush. George Bush replaced Bill as the head of the CIA. Bill was fired because Kissinger was insanely angry because Colby dared to go before the Congress of the United States, who he thought he was to report to, and expose some of the errors and sins and secrets of the CIA. That's why he was fired. You may remember the famous church hearings. He dared to go and explain some of the things that had gotten out of control, and uh, I can tell you a lot more on another program if you want to talk about it, because I'm still writing a book about some of the other. That's why Bill really was concerned about where we were headed, because he knew he had been a great key part of creating some of the very monsters that uh, now threaten us. Thank All right, you. Roger, I wasn't, Roger, I wasn't trying to be mean to you. We're just out of time. That's what. All right, take care. Listen, I know uh, that you're extremely busy, Mr. DeCamp. Can you stay with us about eight more minutes so we can talk to Larry and uh, Andy, and then that'll be it, and also plug out to get your book again? Just minutes. You got it, baby. All right. I know you got a busy law firm going there. Uh, and then we've got the Second Amendment uh, expose, how they're attacking the Second Amendment uh, from Texas to Massachusetts over to uh, Illinois and uh, how we can fight this thing. Uh, it's all coming up in the final 40 minutes, InfoWars.com's website. Don't worry, this show is documented. Alex Jones on the GCN Radio Network. I fell in All right, before we go any further, before we take the two final calls, talking to former state senator John DeCamp, written a powerful book, the Franklin cover up, only $12 shipping included. And it's like a 400-page book. I mean, it's thick. It's, it's powerful stuff, all documented, stood up, you know, nobody sued him. People were convicted. This is a real story. Uh, John, how do folks get the book? And if people order in bulk, are there even bigger discounts, or what's going on there? Um, you order it right, A-W-T, Inc. That's A is in whatever, W is in whatever, and T is in uh, Tom. Or you can just write cover up, get the same place. Well, as in Transylvania, when we're talking about these globalists. <laughs> yeah. Post Office Box 85461, Lincoln, Nebraska, 6 Eight five zero one, and it's just make it twelve bucks shipping, handling everything. It's actually quite a bit more than that. But and I tell you what, anybody that orders on this, I will send a copy of the million dollar judgment I won on the behalf of the one kid, and a uh, little information on myself. I'll put a little resume. Uh, VFW asked me to be the national judge advocate general, as their their national judge advocate general, the Nebraska group did as did the AMVETS. I don't know if anybody's familiar with the AMVETS or yeah, this VFW. They is both asked. Anyway, incredibly credible stuff and powerful to know the nature of our enemies and the New World Order. Quickly, Larry in Indiana, then on to Andy in Texas. Go ahead, Larry. Thank you, Alex. Alex, as incredibly ugly as what John described is, it's important for so-called Christians to expose this type of thing, not turn away and just wipe this stuff off, because that's why so many of them think that uh, George and George Jr. are good guys. Uh if I hadn't read a book which described exactly what you're talking about, John, and for Springmeyer pulling out about this MK Ultra and compromising uh, congressmen with little boys and girls, every single thing you described was detailed in this book. And Alex, when you said uh, they're, you know, what they do is hide things in plain sight, that's exactly what they do. I did never have recognized all the stuff in the Matrix or all the stuff that's going on today that is right out in your face. It's like the chemtrails. People, people ignore it. They think it's a conspiracy theory. It's right down in their face. And now they've got a bill in Congress admitting they're doing it. He's, he's rescinded that, you know, though. Yeah. He changed the direction. But I, I wanted to thank you. I want to encourage people to dig into this stuff. 
There, there's all kind of material on it, but it's like assembling a puzzle, Alex. It's a very ugly puzzle, but as ugly as it is, it's exciting to know what the truth is. These guys' actions are going to be witnesses against them when God comes back and hands out the reward. So that's about the only good all thing right. we can think about. All right, Larry, thanks. Uh, Andy, any questions or comments for our guest? Go ahead. got about a minute and a half. Um, I don't know if you all talked about the C-SPAN show they had yesterday. No. Well, they had a show on C-SPAN about trafficking children, and they had a lady, they had a bunch of people on there. One lady, I don't know if I'd given her name, it's Christine Dolan, and she has the website called HelpSaveKids.org. And she's talking about, she was talking about how Osama bin Laden was like in, like, Serbia and different places, and like, you know, how it's all involved in drug trafficking, nuclear waste trafficking, and she said, called it the bedrock of, you know, all these crimes, and... Well, they admit they kidnapped 2.2 million women out of uh, Eastern and Central Europe in 1999 alone and shipped them to slave brothels all over the Middle East. But then that's the CIA involved yet again, not just the CIA, the whole global control arm. That's a whole other show. Yeah, it's, I mean, I read the story, you know, David Icke's story about uh, Dick Cheney and doing some stuff, you know, and I... Yeah, but then I start thinking that's kind of a discrediting mechanism. There right, right, the yeah. Let me get a quick comment from uh, John DeCamp. John? Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Andy. Far out of time. Uh, John, uh, any closing comments? Just, I'm not much of a conspiracy theorist. I just kind of look at the lay of the land and pretty much accept it the way it is, except when I got involved in this, I kept getting in deeper and deeper and realizing that sometimes all that glitters is not gold and black sometimes is white and up is down and so on and so forth. And so if nothing else, I think it would behoove people to sometimes take a second look. If something doesn't smell right, doesn't look right, maybe there's something wrong and you ought to ask some more questions. And uh, uh, not claiming that uh, I have all the answers, but I think the things I have written about are pretty well uh, supported by the actual physical evidence. By the courts, by the convictions, by the witnesses, uh, it's fact. Uh, John DeCamp, thank you so much for joining us and Godspeed. Yes, sir. Talk to you later. Take care.